Hey there, it's Ashley Stahl here, counterterrorism professional turned career and business coach, and I am here for those moments when you look in the mirror and you realize it's time to make some sort of radical change or U-turn in your life so that you can stop operating on cruise control and start living your life on purpose. So join me here on the U-Turn podcast every single week where you're going to be hearing from inspiring, insightful guests, be it CEOs, spiritual leaders, love experts, or of course, yours truly, so that you can can become your very best self without having to take life so seriously. And don't forget, if you head on over to U-TurnPodcast.com, that's Y-O-U-T-U-R-N Podcast.com, you're going to get access to show notes, which have books and resources mentioned by our guests, as well as access to one of my four free e-courses over at U-TurnPodcast.com. Whether you want to land a new job you love, get clarity on the best career path for you, launch that dream business, or deepen your romantic relationships. Woof, okay, enough about me. Let's get this party started with this week's guest. Hi, everybody. It's Ash, and I'm here with Kylie Macbeth, who is one of my favorite people on Instagram at Being Is Beautiful. And she is someone who is always talking about topics that are near and dear to my heart, be it romance, be it how to not lose yourself. And so we figured this would be the perfect time to talk about how you can succeed in different stages of your romantic relationships and still honor who you truly are and listening to yourself. So Kylie, hi. Hi, love. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored. Yeah, it's so you you have such calm energy. I feel like I've been on way too many podcast interviews today and being able to talk to you, it's like, ooh, Zen. Like <laughs> Back well, to I'm myself. glad I can portray that yeah, and yeah. invite you into that calm energy because my nervous system would probably, would like, be, if we were measuring it, would not would not agree with that. That's <laughs> so funny. Well, hey, it happens to the best of us. Um, well, tell me a little bit before we get into various stages of romantic relationships. Like, what is your story? My story. Well, for the last five years, I've I've dedicated my life to coming back home to all of me, to my emotions, to my body, to my truth, to my heart, to my most authentic self. And I'll be honest, some days um, after my divorce, because that was the real big catalyst for me and and taking the journey back home, um, was filled with moments of bliss. And other days, I wasn't sure if I was going to get up off the floor. Mm -hmm. Um, And when we come through these these pivotal points or these catalyst moments where we're invited to to really do the work or to kind of stay the same route um it's it's can be so challenging to to be to to actually lean in and feel and to be like okay it's time um i I had to go with war with certain patterns because I used to be a yes girl. I was the cool chick, a doormat, a people pleaser, a perfectionist. I was all of them. And I was really disembodied. And because I was so disconnected from my body, I was almost like a control freak. I was trying to control the external environment through managing all these different parts in my mind. And what it led me to feeling was it completely disconnected, depressed, Um, exhausted and with no vital life energy. Uh, So after waking up to all of that, I was like, you know what? I don't want to live the rest of my life feeling like this. So whatever I need to do, whoever I need to hire, whatever school I need to take, um, I'm going to do that. And so I've made that commitment. And uh, over the last five years, I've enrolled in various programs from uh, becoming a health coach as well as a transformational coach through through other few other programs and reading over 200 books and now coaching and empowered women to come alive and and move through any emotional spiritual uh, mental blocks that are blocking them from living a life they truly desire mm-hmm. so it's coming full circle in terms of like the hero's journey if you will it's like okay you have to go inside do your own inner work and then come out and provide Um, the world with your wisdom and all of us have a genius and gifts to share. So Mm -hmm. I I'm here to inspire others to do the same and feel safe in the journey. You know, I had one of my closest friends recently call off her 600 person wedding, like just weeks before the event. So courageous Mm -hmm. and needless to say, you know, life events like that or a divorce, it's like they, they set you so 
into so much darkness potentially. And Absolutely. I'm curious, like, what was that like for you? And ha- what was that moment that you said, I'm getting out of this? Like, what, what did it take or why did you get there? Because some people don't get to that pivot, you know, where yeah. they realize like, oh, I'm, I'm going to bounce out of this. Yeah, I feel really blessed, actually, for that moment in my life, uh, because you're right, some people don't ever get the message or hear it. Uh, I was sitting or laying down in my childhood bedroom. It was the day my ex-husband and I decided to get divorced. And I was overheating, thinking a million thoughts, terrified, you name the emotion, I was feeling it in that moment. And I was just laying there. And I was like, I, I, I don't even know what's next for me. Like, I was completely in the darkest place I'd ever been in my life. And I actually felt, uh, Kate, like just complete chaos. And I remember laying there and I kind of just surrendered. It was like, it was a really weird moment where I was like, fine, I give up. Like I throw my hands up. I'm not going to try to fix this, to control it. And as soon as I did that, I heard these seven words and the seven words were, you created all of this because you were afraid. And I was like, Oh, my gosh. And for the first time in my life, I separated from, I was able to see the story instead of be in it. So I was from an observer uh, role. I was like, oh my gosh. And I started to see all the various versions of me throughout my timeline of my life. And I was like, so I just, (laughs) so with all that new information and awareness, like with a complete, um, mindset opening, if you will, I started writing. And that night I wrote a 12 page letter and I titled it Dear Feared Girl. And it was to the version of me um, that was existing in my reality, which was Kai. But um, I I just, I spoke to her and I, I just unleashed. I don't even know what I said. I said so much, but it was just going through um, all of my pain, all of my emotions at that time and really getting clear about what I was committing to moving forward Mm, because I was like, you will not stay in this place. You have to rise because if you don't rise, you're never getting out of it. And I knew that. Mm, Yeah. It's so interesting. Like I saw a healer the other day and he was like, you have hit so many walls that would put so many people out for years. And it gave me so much compassion because I was like, wow, it's true. I've hit so many walls and they've been so difficult and I've done the work to overcome them the best I can. But I know that some of us, we hit the wall and we choose to stay and we don't even realize we're choosing to stay on the, you know, on the ground. So can you talk to me a little bit about like this idea of losing yourself? Because often we lose ourselves, we lie to ourselves like what, what was it, uh, in your own life or what habits do you think created that? Yeah, not to get too much into psychological theory, but, uh, it does go all the way back. It's like early childhood. It's intergenerational. It's small T and it's what I call small T and big T. So that's small T trauma and big T trauma. And these moments of our lives in early childhood and in our experiences are what separate us from our true authentic self. And we do this because as soon as a part of us feels rejected, we want to hide that and protect that part of us. So we'll put it in a little box and let it live there. Or if we were ashamed for um, having emotions, then we'll try to suppress our emotions because it's not safe because all of us have need to love and to belong. Mm. And we'll become whoever we need to be in order to fit in, to feel safe, to feel loved in our childhood environments. And if we don't recognize those strategies we put in place, so whether that's I'm a high achiever because that's what got me attention from my dad or I'm a perfectionist because that's what helped control um, the emotional safety of my early childhood environment. So we actually disconnect from ourselves at a very young age. And so to beat ourselves up and to say, gosh, um, why didn't you see the red flag or why didn't, why did you let yourself go? Cause some of us can get stuck in those loops. It's like, okay, let's hit pause for a moment. How can we have compassion for the child in us? Cause we have three parts, like the inner child, the inner critic and the empowered adult. Like 
obviously we're, we're going to try to build up the muscles and create more space for the empowered to adult and protective parent to um, care for our own inner child. So this is the parts of us that are afraid um, to be seen, that are afraid to take a risk, that are afraid to fail, that are afraid to enter into a romantic relationship, that are afraid um, to be alone. Mm. Like, so, so we have to, we have to, have compassion and turn towards that. And then, then we have the inner critic. And if we don't have internal space to hear the inner critic or separate who we are from that voice, we actually enmesh with the inner child and we revert back to early coping strategies. Mm, So kind of going back to that, you were saying like the achiever is one way that we learn at a young age to, uh, what would you say, like just dodge vulnerability or disconnect from ourselves? And you also said the, what was the other one? The achiever and the perfectionist. What other archetypes would you say there are? Oh, there's a lot. There's the comedian, there's the caretaker, there's the... Um... So good. I'm like, what else is there? There's, there's so many. There's like a book written on this. Um, but those are the main ones that I know of right now off the top of my head. Uh, but those are the, what we call compensatory strategies. Mm. And so that's when we are acting out of a place of insecurity, lack, and what it's considered other esteem. So it's the belief that we gain our value based off of human doing instead of who we are. So it's what we do that provides ourselves with value instead of who we actually are. So we believe we have to be a certain way, show up a certain way, do certain things in order to be valuable instead of being able to cultivate validation, approval and acceptance from, from being who we actually truly are, Mm. which is just being you. Yeah. So much easier said than done though. Yeah. So what are some of the reasons why you think that in early relationships, like what happens where, Because I think during the dating phase or even in a lot of marriages, one person especially usually feels more like than the other, like they're in a lie. Like they're, they're lying to themselves. They're lying to their partner. They're putting on an image. Um, what Mm, gets somebody to that space? Cause I've definitely had that experience where I was with somebody and it, it was really hard for me to be me. And in retrospect, looking back and having compassion for my younger self, I'm like, wow, why did I put myself through so much torture. So I'm sure so many people have had that, like, what is the catalyst? And I know it's from a young age. Mm -hmm. Um, but what's going on now as adults where we're entering into relationships that we have already abandoned ourselves? Yeah. So it's trying, it's pretending to be like an actor playing a role to get a reward. Right. So mm-hmm. this is who I think he wants me to be, or this is who she thinks, like, I think she wants me to be. So I'm going to be that in order to get the re- reward, which is love, acceptance and belonging. Right. So we, mm-hmm. we all crave connections. So we're like, okay, what do I need to do in order to maintain the connection and get the love, acceptance and belonging? Mm-hmm. And when emotional attachments are in the picture, especially in the container of a romantic relationship, uh, our early is wounding patterns or strategies will start to rise because that's where our relationship blueprint was formed, our love blueprint with our with our siblings and with our parents. So anything in that family system. So we, we almost feel like a fraud, right? We have a deep fear. If they find out who I really am, then they will leave me. Mm-hmm. So, so they never truly see us. And then we can't trust that they love us because we know we are being authentic. So we create a really complicated conundrum for ourselves mm-hmm. because the mask we wear perpetuates the belief that people don't love us. Mm-hmm. So we are choosing and operating out of a place of lack and deficit again. Mm-hmm. So what are some steps or what, when can you even notice, like, what are some ways that people right now who are listening might be able to, because sometimes you're on autopilot so much, you don't even realize you're in a relationship or in some level of commitment in your life that doesn't even sync up with who you are, isn't even a reflection and you're faking it without, without even knowing. So what are some ways that everybody listening can slow down even in their friendships, you know, and yeah take a look at who they're being to get connected to like, is that who they are? 
Mm, yeah, great question. So some of the signs of like losing yourself in relationships, so like the red flags are signs to just be aware of when you're entering into a romantic relationship. And don't get me wrong, in this first stage where it's like the romantic bubble, we some of our stuff slides, like our routines and um, what we do every day to take care of ourselves will kind of get lost in that love phase. However, here are some of the ways that you can really identify when it's it's getting past a point where you're actually letting yourself go and um, enmeshing or becoming really uh, porous with your boundary system. So number one, like putting your partner on a pedestal. Mm. So if you're putting your partner on a pedestal, you're automatically creating a power dynamic and, and that relationship switches out of a place of lack of, or it switches out of a place of mutuality and equality and then goes into hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good way to notice, Oh, am I putting my partner on a pedestal? Well, it's um, hard to know, right? Like it would, ideally maybe even asking your friends like, Hey, do I talk about him or her? Like I'm putting them on a pedestal <laughs> because it's hard to yeah, know, yeah, sure, right? You can... Like you could just tell yourself you're treating them really well. Mm, or you think the world true. of them, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe this is prioritizing their needs over you or their needs over yours. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's another way becoming overly available. Okay. Where you're like constantly sitting by the phone, you're canceling all plans and you're like a hundred percent there, even though, um, it's kind of, you're letting go of anything else you want to be doing or could be doing with your girlfriends, um, censoring yourself. Mm -hmm. So like holding back and not sharing your truth or what your true opinion is um, or pretending you don't know what you want. And you can use a typical example of uh, like, what do you want for dinner? I don't know. What do you want? It's like, oh, wait, why? Why are you pretending like you don't know if you did know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, quitting self-care routines. Mm -hmm. That's a good way to to recognize, oh, I'm losing myself in this relationship. And the best way to check in on all of this is what, like, as a woman, an empowered woman, you have to know what your core values are. Mm -hmm. What are your non-negotiables? What are you saying yes to? What are you saying no to? Mm -hmm. Like, if you don't know that and you don't align your life with that, then uh, it'll cause a lot more frustration down the line. So mm -hmm. if you're feeling exhausted or frustrated in any area of your life, that's a really good indication of a lack of boundaries. Yeah. And, um... You, you were saying like self-care, like what does that mean? Because I know everybody listening, like you and I are in personal development, we talk about self-care a lot, but what are some mm -hmm. self-care routines that you might recommend are I, like examples of things that people might start letting go of as a way to kind of abandon themselves without realizing it? Yeah. So movement. So exercise. Uh, some might let go of exercise. We might let go of our meditation or our journaling routines. We might uh, let go of our weekly girls nights, we might let go of going to the spa, whatever it is, right? It can be so simple as just doing your meal prep, mm -hmm. like letting go of certain things that remind and build your own emotional and mental well-being mm -hmm. and allow you to connect with yourself. Like you need to sit with yourself every day for mm -hmm. at least five minutes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to check in. How am I doing in this area? How do I feel mentally? How do I feel uh, physically? What does my body need today? I love that you're saying this because it's such a reminder that we don't actually know how we feel sometimes unless we check in and ask. Right. And then all of a sudden no, you're like, not. oh, I feel like shit. <laughs> what? <laughs> what happens? Well, that's the reality is the world we live in. It's so fast right now. Yeah. Everything's just go, go, go. And it's climbing, climbing, climbing. And it's like, oh my gosh, everyone needs to just hit pause. And that's why I tell people self-care is not, uh, it's actually about survival at this point in life. I find like, you know, some people say it's selfish and I'm like, no, you actually need it to survive, like from to, to maintain a, a mentally and emotionally stable life. Mm, yeah. And I, you know, I know some friends in our entrepreneur community where they, they don't have space for a romantic relationship because they're so committed to their business. It's like a 20 hour a day thing. <laughs> um, what do you think gets people so lost? I know it's from childhood, but it's like in wanting to be loved. Is there something else that like an indicator in advance, like before you find that person or some heads up that you might be able to track right now if you're on your own or 
you're about to make new friends or is there a way to kind of gauge yourself and preemptively be aware of this? Yeah, I think the best way it comes back to checking with your body, Mm -hmm. like maintaining a practice that allows you to cultivate a connection to your body so that you are aware of how you're feeling Mm -hmm. in your body day by day with each interaction, your body's communicating to you about how that interaction felt. You know, when you leave a friend after she just potentially shared two hours of information or gossip with you and you leave the conversation feeling drained and exhausted. Yeah. Well, that's an indication that's not, that's not supportive, right? Yeah. And so then there would be potentially an invitation there of I'm not your person for that type of um, communication or gossip, right? So it comes back down to connection to your body. So like, are you in your body? Do you even know what you want? Mm-hmm. Like what type of friendships are you committed to cultivating? What what type of relationship are you looking for? What's your relationship vision? What are the qualities you're seeking in a partner? Mm-hmm. And are you acting out those qualities in yourself right now? Mm-hmm. Like, Getting clear on your non-negotiables also helps. Yeah. So, I mean, we were talking about stage one being romance. So, like, what other indicators are, you know, key trademarks of this stage that people should be aware of? Aware of in, like, the... Just, like, in the journey of honoring themselves, you know? Okay. Uh, I think I understand your question. So... In the closeness, like in stage one, is like all about romance, right? So this is showing your best parts. This is getting to know somebody. This is going on dates, having fun. Um, it's what everyone calls the honeymoon stage, of course. And um, it's a beautiful stage of relationship. It's one that should be enjoyed thoroughly. Uh, and it's it's the commitment muscles that, that actually move us into stage two. Uh, so it's getting clear up front. What is my intention with this relationship? Mm. What do I, what do I want as a woman? Do I want to be a wife? Do I want to have kids? Do I want my partner or do I want to live somewhere else? Like, am I aware of all of these wants so that I can bring that information into the container of the relationship up front so that we can, you know, build in the same direction. Mm-hmm. Cause if we're, our intentions are not aligned, uh, that that's not going to support you. So again, it all comes back to knowing yourself, right? <laughs> yeah. It also just makes me think a lot about like this idea of like the wrong timing, you know, like everything in life is timing. And I was reading this book and just thinking like, is there even such a thing as the wrong time or is it just the wrong people? Because what I've um, found is that when powerful opportunities find me, I make it the right time. Yeah. And so it's almost like, what if there's somebody that is ready for marriage and then they meet somebody who's like younger and they're off in the world, but maybe that younger person meets this person and suddenly they decide that it's time. Like, how do you gauge like abandoning yourself versus rising into like a situation? That's a really good question. And it's like my own personal experience. So This is, so I'll just use my own personal example because it it helps to answer this. When Mark and I first started dating, he was very clear. He wanted children in two years, Mm -hmm. like pretty adamant. And of course up front, I'm like, yeah, I can see that. And it has obviously been past two years and children aren't even, I mean, they're definitely a topic of conversation, but it's not like immediate. And that actually caused a lot of friction Mm -hmm. for us because it was like, Hey, you said this and then you didn't follow through on it. And it was because it wasn't from an integrated place for me Mm -hmm. because although I wanted it intellectually, the woman in me wanted it. There's other parts of me that are running up against walls and making that decision where I'm afraid of commitment Mm-hmm. I'm afraid of getting abandoned and hurt again. I'm afraid of um, the pain that comes when relationships end. So if I haven't dealt with any of that and uh, I'm being asked to move forward, then then that's my own inner work. But it can be done, right? So 
So can both partners not get stuck on a certain timeline and still honor themselves? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like you might have a timeline or you want to get married and your partner doesn't, and they could be completely adamant on that. Are you going to try to change their minds? Uh, That's your decision, right? Mm -hmm. Like, do you want to invest, you know, women are really good at that. It's like, oh, well, I'll show you that you want to marry me. And it's like, wait, but you're not actually listening to them. Yes. And you brought up something that I find very common in early stages. And I've seen this a lot in Los Angeles is men like I've experienced will look you in the eye and be like, I am ready to find the one I am ready to get married. I'm ready to have kids. But then I'm watching their behaviors in their romantic connections. These are guy friends I'll have, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, oh, wow. But it's not matching up because they're being really flaky with all these girls that they haven't really invested the time to get to know stuff like that. So I think there's also this dynamic where a lot of people miss the reality that somebody can look you in the eye and say, I want this. And that's great. They believe that. But are they integrated enough to actually be in a space where they're actually going to take action on it? You just nailed it right there. You're right. Because to be able to, to take action, you have to move through the emotional blocks that are in the way from you taking that action. So it's one thing to say something from an intellectual understanding, and it's another thing to actually embody it and make it a reality. Yeah. So if you haven't cleared any trauma or any of your own blocks, emotional, mental, around moving forward and f- fulfilling on that that want of yours, I want to, I'm serious about getting married, whatever it is, um, then you're going to constantly recreate scenarios that ensure that you actually don't do that, which can be very frustrating, actually. Yeah, (laughs) totally. Because it's like you're rocking around the world saying, this is what I want, but you you have all these blocks and beliefs. And so you just keep on attracting these flaky situations because that's what another part of you wants. It's just so interesting. Yeah, because you don't feel safe yet. And, and, And so it's just, it's doing the work, right? So if you find a partner who you're like, oh, I'm willing to do the work with, that's why I always ask the couples I work with, are you both willing to do the work that it takes to move through the next stage? And sometimes the work is letting go, but sometimes it's not. It's actually doing the emotional work that allows them to expand the container of their relationship. And if they both are willing, then that's a beautiful sign. Mm hmm. And, you know, I know in personal development, we always say, are you willing to do the work? And I think everybody listening, there's probably this like nebulous confusion, like what does the work even mean? And I know, I know for me, like I journal a lot. And that's one way that I release like feelings or pain. But what is something actionable that everybody listening now can do the work? You know, like, let's say Sally Mae is listening right now. And she's like, I want to get married. But she feels like, why do I keep being in these situations with these flaky guys? Like, what is one way she could do the work to realize, like, what are those blocks that are creating that reality? Good old Sally Mae. I know. Love gotta her. love good Sal. Gotta love her. Uh, <laughs> so reading good books. I mean, that's something, uh, relationship books. Um, journaling is a great way uh, to do work. Um, if you want a more intensive, then find somebody who's you know, teaching the principles of having a healthy and fulfilling relationship, whether that's a relationship coach or a therapist, or just getting curious, okay, what is my love blueprint? What are some of the beliefs I have about being a woman? What are some of the beliefs I have about men or being a man? What are some of the beliefs that I've been modeled and have seen about relationship, about marriage, about children? Like there's so many ways to get really curious about what it, what our love blueprint is Mm -hmm. and start to just create clarity and awareness around whatever's unconscious and bring it out into the conscious. Okay. So let's pretend I'm your subject, Kylie, God bless us right now. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, amazing. This this podcast (laughs) is about to get real. Like I need to put a little, like people are going to wear like an, I survive t-shirt by the end of this episode, (laughs) but let's pretend like I'm the subject here. And I'm like, what would be the first thing you would tell me to do? Let's like, let's, and actually this is reality. Like I want love yeah. in my life and it hasn't happened yet. I mean, I've had many loves, but they haven't been the right one for me. Yeah. So what would be like the first step for anybody listening? Well, what are you doing in order to, to align yourself with that great love? Like what type of partner, like, are you currently doing anything that is communicating that that's what you want in your life? I'm not dating online, but okay. I am, I have like a big network and I have a, a lot of friends in LA. So I'm really social and I'm always meeting people out in the city. 
um, as far as like on myself, like I'm just trying to be the best I can be. Like I'm really like trying to get inspired as much as possible in my business. I'm going to meditation classes like probably three times a week. Amazing. Um, and I'm working out. I love that. Trying to get You're lit doing- in life. <laughs> <laughs> but that's really important during this time is to connect with yourself, like yeah. know who you are and you're ready for a potential long. What are you ready for? What yeah. are you looking to cultivate? Yeah, like and create? I'm, I'm ready for my dream human soulmate connection. Mm, beautiful. So then I would, are you currently working with anybody personally or have you worked with anybody personally uh, on um, understanding your love blueprint, like no. some of the beliefs you hold about relationships. No, I mean, I've done so much personal development and journaling and reading books. So I have some ideas around it, but I'm so curious on your approach for everybody listening. <laughs> You're like, I've done a lot of work already. Kai. I've done a lot of work on this shit, Kylie. <laughs> this right? is still happening. <laughs> Almost got so, married two years ago and called it off. So here I am. Yeah, here you are. And so, What are you making your singleness mean about you right now or about relationships or what have you made your relationship history? Like what's your current story around relationships? I would say the story is that, huh, that's such a great question. Okay. So everybody listening, ask yourself, what is the story you're telling yourself about relationships? Can somebody do this if they're in a relationship as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I would say that, um, what I'm looking for is very hard to find. I'm in a scarcity story because I like very specific things. And because you like specific things, that means it's more, it's more difficult to come by. And so what do you make that mean about yourself? That it's going to be a while and that I just kind of have to be patient. Um, okay. I'm making it mean that my business is really important because it's something I have to do in the Mm -hmm. world. And, but in a way it's almost like a, a, a costume. Like it saves me. It feels like it protects me from other people. Like if I was on my own and I didn't have a career, that would feel like an identity crisis. Uh, Yeah. I hear you. So yeah, that, that, that would be it. Mm Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, there's obviously some, some things that automatically come up for me when you say that. So is that story supporting you right now? I would say no, because like I go out in the world and I'm like, oh, like what I'm looking for is a unicorn. So I might as well just like focus on my friends right now. Mm. And is that what you want to be focusing on right now? I mean, I love my friends. I'm so committed to them. Yeah. I would love to have epic love in my life. Yeah. Because it's almost like we need to create a, a both and for you or for many people. Like I can be a powerful career woman with a wonderful thriving community and be in an epic, uh, fulfilling partnership with a man of my dreams. Yeah. Right. So how can, what, what would be a new upgraded story for you in like a relationship story for you that felt really good and aligned with what you're wanting to cultivate and create in your life right now? Mm, That the options are limitless and amazing. And I would say one limiting story I've held that I think a lot of women hold is like, I'm going to have to handle everything. Hmm. Like, where did you learn that? Uh, see, that's a great question. And I think, I hope everybody who's listening, like asking yourself, where did you learn that? Um, I would say like from a young age, my dad had a lot of anxiety. He was an amazing, he's an amazing human, but he had a lot of anxiety. And I think there's a level of caretaking when you're in a house with a dad who's highly anxious. Would you say? Absolutely. So I kind of learned to handle the situation. Yeah. You would see that even from an, from the modeling of yourself in that family system, but also your mother and how she dealt with that. She kind of keeled over and was like, Oh, yeah, like she didn't want to fight it. She just kind of let him have his tidal wave. Mm. And, and she so was amazing. When like you, amazing dad, but just highly anxious. Yeah. And that's okay. Like, but it it's not about dad. It's, it's actually about how it's affecting you. Yeah. And your ability to show up and create what, what it is that your heart truly desires. But if there's a block where it's even unconscious, where 
if I'm in a romantic relationship and I get married, then I'm going to have to take care of him. Yeah. Right? This can be so old and I don't want that because who would want that? Right. You know, cause it doesn't feel good. And so if you don't, so it's working through that. So the fact that you're even, you're even aware of that is beautiful because you can say, that's not true. That doesn't have to be true for me. So then because, let's, let's pause really quick and go through the questions you asked me for everybody who's listening. Okay. So the first thing is what is the story you're telling yourself about relationships? And this could be about friendships or romantic relationships, whether you're single or in one, right? Mm -hmm. So what is going on in your mind about it? What are the judgments you hold about it? And then the second thing is where did you learn that from? Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Moving forward. <laughs> And then what story are you committed to like now? Mm. Because you'll have to act in a different way once you commit to a new story. Because you feel really comfortable in your old story of, of I'm looking for it. a unicorn and it's going to take five years to find him or a long time. Yeah. yeah. Because then it doesn't put any pressure on you right now to actually move forward and get vulnerable and get in the game and, and open your heart again. Now you could not be ready for that, but then there's also like, can you change that story to support you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I guess an ideal story would be like, but I, I do also have this. I feel like options are everywhere. I just need a unicorn. You know what I mean? Like there's like a, a judgmental, egoic, like I need the best person crazy, you know? Well, not crazy because you're allowed to have your preferences, love. Yeah. It's just your unicorn's out there. Yeah, no, def I think... And, and as far as like somebody who's listening that maybe is in a relationship, what would you suggest um, they do? So let's say they're with somebody and the story that they have about relationships is that they're supposed to be hard. I see this all the time. So then the question is, where did you learn that? Where, where did you learn that relationships were hard? Did you see that on your, and usually it's their parents, right? Yeah. Parents, society can, it's everywhere, especially that story. And you always, I always, when I'm working on somebody, I always trust whatever memory comes up for them first. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay. And then what is a new story you want? Right. That's the third mm -hmm. question. Yeah. What is a new story that you're, that feels good and that you're committed to? It's hard for me to believe the story I want. I want the story that it's easy, but it's hard to believe that. Because then I almost feel like if anything's hard, I'm going to avoid it if I really believe that it could be easy. But what if the right thing is hard? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. So then again, you're like, okay, what stories do I have around it being easy? And what stories do I have around when a relationship's hard? Yeah. Right? So a if a relationship's lot of hard, I believe it's hard. And it's because you believe it's hard forever. There's like a no ending point, maybe. At least that's what I'm hearing. Uh, of like, what's the finality? What's the stage? Like, how do we move through this? And if you don't have the tools to move through it, that's when you get a little stuck in those hard phases. Yeah. And that's where you need to, to actually find support or go through um, and grow. Because relationships really are containers. They are the number one container for growth and healing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The and so whenever you run life. into roadblocks, cause you will, right. Especially in the container of a romantic relationship and you will have conflicts mm -hmm. and you will have disagreements and you will have stages of bliss and stages of, I can't stand you. Uh huh. So talk but to it, me about that. Cause the second stage is conflict after romance, correct? Yeah. So this is like your power struggle. So this is figuring out, um, like not who runs the roost because that's not what it's about because it's about mutuality and equality but like all of our old stuff as we commit and create um more i guess of an emotional attachment more of our old stuff is going to come up to be worked through in the container of that relationship mm -hmm. so you're going to come up against conflicts mm -hmm. and so what tools do you have in order to move through your conflict? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, do you even know how to move through conflict in a, in a way that is kind and clear? Do you even know how to set boundaries up front in stage one so that you, you kind of um, diminish uh, all of the conflict because it's not possible. And then even what are your stories on co around conflict? Yes. So true. Cause some people are, they're so threatened by conflict that they don't want to, they avoid it outright. 
Right. Because women were taught to act like a lady, you know, don't be a bitch. Like all of these certain <laughs> stories and messages we've been sent about stay quiet, keep to yourself, act prim and proper. And con- and for many of us, too, conflict actually wasn't safe because in our early childhood homes, it was more of aggression instead of actually clean um, anger and uh, moving from conflict to connection instead of like conflict to disconnection. Uh huh. Uh huh. But there was no, like, what's the resolution? Like that's, that's what you have to focus on more. Mm-hmm. It's like not the conflict. It's like, okay, what, what is the solution to this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And how can we move through our blocks and honor and understand and try to understand and have compassion for one another's viewpoints and, um, move through them. Yes. You know, not everyone was given the gift of parents who know how to regulate their own nervous system, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so my sense is that our traumas come from that and when, and our beliefs about conflict, you know, and, and it's funny, this was just making me think about how like back in the retro days of parenting, how like slapping your kid on the ass with a belt was like somehow appropriate versus these days. It's like, that's right. just, like you're going to get co- social services is going to be called on you, you know? For sure. Um, so, you know, there's some conflict there, right? Like a lot of us at this age in our thirties, it's realistic to assume that like somebody's grandma hit them with a belt or something just so <laughs> crazy to even process right now. Um, but what do you have to say about power struggle? Because I find this very interesting. Like, does it start early on? Um, if you, if you know, whoever's listening, let's say you have a boyfriend, you have a girlfriend. Um, what do you have to say about that? so it's all it's all about at least in my limited experience on this topic right now i'm actually researching it a lot um but it's all about autonomy and being allowed to have your freedom of Mm self-expression so is the container of your relationship um allowing you to be you or is there control? Is there manipulation? Are those some of the ways that we're trying to get our way because we don't know how to get it any other way? Mm. Got it. Which is an ineffective solution. Um, however, it's it's also like, okay, who's making the decisions too? Like, and power struggles can be even like where we're living, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, what are some of the disagreements or conflicts around that? And, and how are we going to find middle ground here? Mm-hmm. And it's all, it all comes back down to respect, especially in relationships is can I respect another's viewpoint and be compassionate and try to find a solution that works for both of us. And of course you'll hear like compromise and how can we both find resolve? Um, I used to hate the word compromise so much. <laughs> so I, was like, I don't want to compromise on anything, you know, but uh, I think that's a little unfair. Well, society would be like, what a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> totally <Okay>. right. <laughs> um, well, I, I mean, I love this. And I also want to just add to what you were saying is you said respect, be able to respect someone, but it's respect the person you're with. Because I think yeah. what I'm finding is a lot of relationships that I've seen where somebody doesn't respect the other person. And as far as I'm concerned, and you can correct me on this, like, what do you have if there's no respect? Yeah. What's left? Mm. Resentment. Yeah. What a bummer. What a bummer yeah. of a feeling. Okay. A is really it, unhealthy relationship foundation. Yeah. Well, so when does, yeah. when does the power struggle begin? Is it early on in the early stages and it carries on? So if somebody's listening right now and they're in a relationship with a power struggle, is that something that could have been traced early? Or if somebody yeah. who's single and listening, can they notice in their dating life if there's about to be an unnecessary, unhealthy power struggle with somebody that they're engaging with in some way? Mm, good question. I, you know, especially in the romantic phase of phase one, we're going to be blind to a lot of different things. And what, and two, because we're not, we're trying to kind of romance them. We're trying to, uh, I, I don't know. It's just a fun, it's a, it, it's really a fun stage, but in that stage, there can be a lot of blind spots for us where we're not seeing the full picture and we're not even showing the full picture. Let's be honest. In stage one of a relationship, we don't show all of our feathers up front. And it's actually, whenever I see people like, um, 
say stuff, especially on Instagram, I get so frustrated where it's like, you know, show yourself all up front. Like you, it's not even, it's not about that. It's like trusting the process. You, if you don't feel safe to show every single thing in your closet up, you know, in the first 10 dates, like that's okay. Mm. Like usually we expand and show and deepen our level of intimacy over time with a, with an increase in emotional safety. If somebody is not emotionally responsive to us at the very beginning, we're not going to really feel safe to share, um, certain vulnerable parts of ourselves. So I think that takes time. Um, in terms of identifying power struggles, I think again, like getting connected back into your body, like how does my body feel after certain comments? Mm -hmm. Like, is there a comment somebody made about their perception or the way they see the world that I want some clarity around or, um, then I would open up dialogue around anything that's potentially coming up for you that doesn't feel good so that you can understand it, but don't come from like a judgmental stance. It's like, Hey, I want to reach towards you and I want to understand. So tell me about this some more because mm-hmm. I'm interested in learning about you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love or that. Like, so it's like, what's behind the words, right? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I want to add to this because in, in when it talks, you just talking about power struggles, what I've learned and cause I've been reading so much is that there's a difference between trying to figure out, is this just an interaction that I'm having that's unpleasant or is this a part of the dynamic that would exist in partnership with a person? Um, and what I mean by that is like, let's say, you know, single Sally is dating and she's had five amazing dates with Joe and suddenly Joe disappears. Maybe mm-hmm. something is going on for Joe. We don't know, right? We can't make stories yeah. up for Joe. There's no possible way that we're going to have the accurate answer. Only Joe knows. But I'm sure, sto- you know, Sally is like, poor Sally. We've been like, she's our sacrificial lamb today. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Sally. Poor She's been through some shit. Yeah. Yeah. She's like sitting at home. Had a rough Friday. Yeah. Rough, <laughs> freaky Friday in Sally town. But yeah. So like, let's just say she's going through all these stories in her head. Like he's this and I'm that. And this is why this is happening. And then he comes back a couple of weeks later and he wants to see her again. Obviously she can ask him like, Hey, I noticed a shift and where'd you go? But like, I would say, isn't it possible that we should practice some level of grace in the early stages where we don't know each other or we don't owe each other anything? And that maybe late, like if it becomes a pattern, that's when you can establish it's a power struggle. Like what are your thoughts on that kind of stuff? Because there's a lot of one-offs that happen in dating yeah. and there's a lot of one-offs that happen in romantic relationships, you know, where maybe your partner does something that's totally what you thought to be out of character Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think that sometimes we make a story up about and we make meaning out of it of what it means about the person, what it means about us. But is there some sort of grace that we should be considering practicing on one off things? Because to me, unless it's a pattern where it keeps on happening, that to me is an indicator of a power struggle or something that's not a match for you. But if it's I don't know, what are your thoughts on all of this stuff? Yeah, actually, I think you bring up a really great point. And we are meaning making machines. We'll make meaning out of anything. So to really get check in around what you're making it mean is really helpful. Uh, yeah, I think we should offer grace and there's definitely a difference between dating and in a relationship. Like as soon as it's a relationship and you've both made the intention to move forward and become exclusive and if you talked about it, then obviously you handle that a lot differently than you would in a dating scenario. Yeah. Right. Poor Sally. She's still really in it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So the final stage, I don't even know how long we've been talking. Okay. So final stage, the reunion and the commitment. So power struggle, power struggle, fighting, fighting, finding each other's ground, finding flow. And then there's reunion and commitment. What is this about? This is all about committing to what you both are, are creating in the container of your relationship. What are your shared values together? Mm-hmm. Like, is it family? Is it co-creating in work? Is it um, sharing your passions to serve and to um, build community? Like, what is it that brings you two together? Like, almost like, you know, how you, you hear, like, remember your why? This is, like, very similar. Is like, 
we reun, re, we reunite in the, our shared commitments to each other, but also to our greater purpose mm-hmm. in, in, with our partner. Got it. Got it. So what is this kind of like, is there like a timeline for this stage? I mean, you know me, I'm, I come from <laughs> counterterrorism and data. So let's get this data going. <laughs> so like, what is the exact time frame for each of these stages? How many day- days? Like yeah. 366, 367? Like, what are we talking here? <laughs> you know, it's constant. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like, especially in two and three, like, between conflict and reunion? Well, like, yeah, it is just I was going like, to ask that too. Like, do you keep going through all of these three stages, romance, conflict, and reunion? Like, what is this, what does it look like? Right. Um, that's a really good question. Actually. I haven't even thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. In terms See? of the tr- transitioning through all three stages again. Um, I'm sure there are certain moments in, in the relationship history where certain things happen that bring us closer And we enter in in through, I don't think there's like a solid, like you cross and then you never go back. I actually think it's like, um, I know your mind is like, wait, I want a box or it's (laughs) like the box, like our minds want boxes, but it's like, it's, it's fluid. It's fluid. Yeah. Okay. Right. Because when certain things are triggered, we might revert back into a different, a different version or coping strategy and then we'll have to move through the stages again it's just like with our relationship to ourselves we're always growing and expanding and digging up old stuff and reintegrating and we bring that to the relationship yeah so yeah you you're gonna go through um I also wonder if like some people just kind of vacillate between like one or two of them you know where they just hang out in conflict most of the time you know and then they go into romance like maybe well, yeah that's like an abusive relationship, I'm guessing, where it's like conflict, conflict, conflict and then there's like the, the trauma bond of like romance afterward and then conflict again. Yeah, and that's more of like talking about the stages in terms of codependent, co-independent and being centered relationships. Got it. So those those are different. Those are actually like how you would define the actual overall person and personality and the way they relate in their relationship. Now, don't get me wrong. You can move through those stages in one relationship, but generally, um, not so much. You would leave one, learn a lot about your relationship patterns and then be like, okay, now I'm on to the next one. And you might level up into like co-independent where you know who you are, you have your boundaries. But then after that one, or even in the same relationship, you might grow into a being centered relationship. That's a whole different that's a whole different topic of conversation. You're like, that's a whole more dysfunctional ladder of stages. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God, Kylie, I have to hand it to you. Like, Thank God we're friends and we have some sort of report because I really hit you hard on this episode today. (laughs) I'm like, Kylie, I hope you're, uh, you know how you were saying like, do you ever notice after an hour conversation, your friend makes you feel drained? I'm like, well, hoping (laughs) Kylie leaves this conversation with some energy. (laughs) I'm so energized right now. Really? I've really thrown you some curveballs. Or do I just think I am and you're totally like as a little Zen master over there? No, you're 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 so good actually. Really? Yeah. I'm I feel working. really good about everything you asked me. I, I do feel like we need to have a circle back on power struggles once I learn a lot more about that. Yeah. Um for sure. But no, it was so much fun. So much fun. Um, just a couple final questions. Um, what is a book that you think, you know, on these topics that you just love and everybody should read on these topics? Uh, so transformation through intimacy by Dr. Robert Augustus masters Okay, is the book I would definitely recommend on this topic. Um, for sure. Wonderful. And as far as like life or love advice, like what is the best advice you've ever gotten? (laughs) Um, Don't ever attack someone's core. Oh, wow. I love that. Yeah, that was from my dad. Took that song. Okay, beautiful. And um, where can everybody find you? Because obviously we're all obsessed with you now. (laughs) I love you so much. (laughs) Uh, So. You can find me daily over on Instagram at being is beautiful, um, as well as my website, Kylie I also have a monthly newsletter, which you can subscribe to either on the website or, um, on my Instagram page as well. 
And then my business, which is the wellness platform and program, which helps empower women come alive in every single area of their life is zurahealth.com. Amazing. But if you follow me anywhere, you'll see me everywhere. So <laughs> do you know what I was thinking? How your Instagram handle is at being is beautiful. Like I feel like if my inner child back in the day had an Instagram handle, it would be doing is beautiful. Like do, do, <laughs> do, achieve, achieve, achieve. <laughs> For sure, right? Mine too. Doing is beautiful. Forget being. <laughs> <laughs> I'm anyway. so happy I resonated with that like six years ago. That was oh even my before God. my big like unfolding. Oh. But I was like, it was like a premonition, right? Yeah. I was like, oh, I'm headed in that way because I definitely wasn't being. Yeah. I was doing, yeah. doing, doing. Yeah, everybody always says, stop being a human doing and start being a human being. And thank God there's examples like you out there doing this work to implement it into your own life, walk the walk, and also just learn. So thank you so much for being here. And I just love you. I love you too, love. And thank you so much for saying that. I really appreciate that. And thank you for having me. Hey there. Um, I am just sitting here after this episode with my friend Kylie and just feeling such a vulnerability hangover because my career has always been where I put in the work and I know how to shine, even if sometimes I'm choosing not to. And I'm choosing to fail in my career sometimes because I'm you know, for lack of a better term, not feeling the motivation or something that's happened before. My career has always been a place where I know I can go and feel competent and capable and like I'm taking care of myself. But to have Kylie ask me about my love life, to ask me what I believe about it on a podcast, no less, that I email out to 600,000 of you, it felt so vulnerable And what I got out of it was so much about patterns versus one-off incidents. And so I wanted to circle back on my conversation with Kylie to discuss that, that duo with you. So when somebody is in your life, often we will make meaning of a scenario that very well could be a one-off, but maybe that scenario that's happening with them is something that reminds us of something painful in the past and our ego is trying to protect us from having to go through it again. So if somebody does something, it triggers some sort of memory, even if we're not conscious of it, that makes us think, oh my gosh, not again. You know, and our whole body closes down and our being closes down. And what I've found about my own mindset that I want to impart to you after doing years of work on this is there's such a benefit of taking things as a one-off until they prove themselves as a pattern. So, for example, if somebody says something hurtful and you feel yourself closing down and you tell yourself what it means about the person, you're making a story about the person that could very well just be a one-off, out-of-character incident. And instead of deciding that you know what it's about, what the context is, why they would do that, I would advise you to consider the dynamic of patterns to consider the possibility that you don't want to make a story up about what this incident means until you've actually seen it become a pattern with that person. Because the pattern is feedback that this is something that is intrinsic to their being right now. And somebody who's committed and willing to grow, really what the work is, is looking at your behavioral patterns. You know, whether it's that you tend to break up with men before they hurt you or end friendships over something small because you feel too vulnerable or you don't finish things you start, whatever those patterns are. If you're committed and willing to grow, that's where transformation is because every single pattern that you have in your life, in a way, it's kind of like the Pantheon in Italy or the Jefferson Memorial in DC. The pattern is the cap. It's the top of the memorial or the Pantheon. But all the pillars that hold it up are the beliefs that you hold that keep you acting that way. So one of the most powerful things I've learned from my love life and for my friendships is to start paying attention to my patterns and to start practicing forgiveness, grace, kindness, and the benefit of the doubt 
for one-off incidents. And this has really, really shifted my relationships and my life because I'm constantly looking at people through the goggles of the benefit of the doubt until I get evidence that it could be a pattern. And then if I really like the person, whether it's a friend or somebody romantically, I'll ask about it. I'll get curious because you don't ever want to be like Walt Whitman says, don't be judgmental, just be curious. So I'm never trying to judge somebody's behaviors, but I will get curious and say, hey, I noticed you shifted in this way. What was up for you? Like, was there something that was driving that? And there's a couple things. Number one, they may not see the pattern yet, but they might be willing to acknowledge that there was a shift. And if they acknowledge it, that's somebody who is willing to grow. Or number two, they deny what was really an obvious behavior for you that you really saw. And if they deny it, they're not willing to look at their patterns. And that's just feedback that 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 might not be somebody that you can grow with, be it as a friend or be it as a romantic partner. So that's the first thing that I really left the episode with Kylie. The second thing I left with was around expectations versus standards. So we talked a little bit about the beginning of a relationship, and I think this applies to friendships as well. In the beginning, I find that society, we have so many different standards of how people should show up, why we think they should show up that way. We have a whole story of if they're the right person, then they're going to do this. But what I've learned more and more is until somebody knows the total gem and gift that is you, you can't expect them to coordinate their schedule and shift their entire life to get to know you because actually that's quite it's quite bizarre knowing that they have this full busy life and this person's come in they don't know they're shifting it around and so what i've practiced in my love life and in my friendships is patience for new people allowing them to go at their pace and after really spending some time getting to know them so let's say joe schmo comes into my life and he sees me once every couple of weeks well, maybe after a couple months, after I've seen him four or five times, I might say, hey, look, it's been really nice getting to know you. You know, I'm really looking to build momentum with somebody and get to know them. So it could be like that. After I've invested enough time where I feel like I can really step in and say, hey, look, I'm noticing this is your pattern of where you're at and making time with us. This is where I stand. Same thing with friendships. You know, maybe certain friends don't prioritize you and they're a little bit flakier because they don't really have space in their life for you, but you guys had a connection. I've had so many girlfriends tell me they've met this new friend and the friends being flaky with them. And if there's anything I've learned to practice with new people, friendships alike, it's just a patience and a space to see who they are before I even ask or expect or want for them to show up in a way that's a little more consistent in my life. I think there's something to be said for being a sponge, keeping your expectations low for people who you don't know, but keeping your standards high for the people you do welcome into your life. Because expectations put you in this victimized role. It's like you've decided somebody should be showing up, you haven't communicated it, and nobody wins. Standards are the bare minimum that people need to hold to stay in your life. And so my recommendation now is to start paying attention to your own behavioral patterns in relationships and to start questioning the beliefs you have that keep you in those patterns and to start paying attention and practicing kindness, empathy, and patience with the people who might be having a one-off moment with you. And when you see it's a pattern, practice the courageousness to ask them about their shift from a curious standpoint. Learn more about who that person is. If they open up to you and they acknowledge it, they're growth-minded. If they don't want to look at it, they might not be in a place where they can meet your consciousness. And I would say always know when you're in a state of expectations versus just holding a standard. All right, this is Ashley Stahl signing off on the U-Turn podcast. I'm about to go help a bunch of ghostwriting clients at Cake Publishing. And I'm just so honored that you tuned into this episode. I can't wait to connect with you next week. Thanks again for tuning into this week's episode of the U-Turn Podcast. You can find all of the resources that our guest mentioned on our show notes at U-TurnPodcast.com. That's Y-O-U-T-U-R-N Podcast. 
www.thepowerfulmoms.com. Also, don't forget on the website, we've got our four free e-courses, whether you want to land a new job you love, get clarity on the best career path for you, launch your dream business, or deepen your romantic relationships. I'll talk to you soon. Can't wait to connect on next week's episode.